Hi and welcome to this episode of building an R53 turbocharged engine. In this episode we'll be building the bottom end of the engine, assembling the pistons with the con rods and getting the crank in. What I would like to do is take a moment to apologise for some of the camera angles throughout this video. Most of them are about as poor as I normally would be but there's a couple of uh, minutes worth of shot where I've managed to completely cut myself out of the clip but the information that's in there is useful so I've decided to keep it in. On the next episode there will be three or four more cameras joining me like this little GoPro here. The aim is to get closer views and show what's going on and there will also be two microphones joining to hopefully get the audio quality a little bit better than what I'm currently shooting on. What you will notice throughout the video is I'm working on a small bench and on this small trolley. I've come to the uh, realisation that that just isn't enough room for me to be doing this video and to continue shooting so I've took a few days and I've basically knocked together a workbench behind me and all of this workbench contains pretty much everything that's going to be going on or in this particular engine. Today what I'll be fitting is the top ring, the second ring and the oil scraper and oil rings. Obviously I've got to gap these if they need to so I've got to go through the process of checking these. Some of the tools I use to check them is an old piston with a ring in the second groove. The reason for that is when I want to gap uh, using feeler gauges the rings I want to make sure that all of the rings are at the right level and also parallel with the face. So this allows me to insert a ring and push down and that then doesn't go any further, that gives me a nice level bed. You can buy tools to do this, but this works fantastically if you've got a spare set of uh, pistons kicking about. To do this, uh, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, I'll just do the top ring uh, for this particular video. What I'll do is I tend to insert the ring with the word top facing up, and now I can see that that's still not sitting straight. I'll take my used Cooper S piston, uh, make sure the ring is fairly central, doesn't really matter other than the fact I don't want it to go down and I'll just tap the ring in, there we go, it doesn't go any further. I know that ring now is, is parallel to the top so I can take my feeler gauges and we've got bottom tolerance which is 0.2 and I can just check the drag on that. I can see there's, there's plenty there so what I'm going to do is just go to my top size. Uh, I have already put this one in so I do know that it's okay and on top size I can just feel that that's starting to drag so I'd probably say that we're about um, 0.38 is probably the gap that I got my first ring so once I've got that ring done I continue to do all of these rings that I've got here I'll then do each cylinder keeping each one match the cylinder if needs be I'll have to remove material off uh, the rings but generally with the Woosner pistons and because I've had it all lined and it's all been honed recently it's all brand new there won't be any issues I don't think with this engine I can then use um, uh, my piston ring tool all that does is you basically nearly dropped it uh, put the piston ring in and it allows me to expand it to get it over the piston I have in the past uh, just rolled the rings in place where you roll them down the piston um, and they tend to uh, they tend to move relatively easy. I mean, you can you can take one and you can roll it off. Uh, obviously, this is not going to happen as well because I'm on a video. But you can roll them out, um, and you can roll them in fairly easily as well. They they are brittle. You do need to be careful that you're not going to snap them. Um, and it's just a lot easier with a tool. You don't need a tool, but if you're going to do it. They're only about a tenner, there might even be less. Uh, just get yourself a tool, makes your life a little bit easier, and, and that's what you want. The last thing you want to be doing is snapping a ring, trying to insert it, or scratching the side of your piston. These are the little rings, uh, they hold the gudgeon pin in, uh, stop it rolling around. Not with all pistons, they all vary. Some need cir circlet pliers, some need other tools to insert them. The Woosner pistons are quite nice, you can just roll them in. Um, Again, it's a lot easier when you're not trying to record it because it just goes, there you go, they're snapped in. Uh, these are guaranteed um, when you try to remove them to go into your eyeballs uh, every single time. This is the uh, piston and conrod setup now. So this is pretty much ready to go in the engine. I still need to uh, clock the rings and put them in the right place, but 
Goodrum pins are in, uh, spring pins are in to hold it, oil scrapers in, second ring is in and main rings in. The next thing I'm going to install into the engine is this banjo type arrangement oil squirter. These sit um, inside the block on the main oil gallery feed and they spray oil up to the bottom of the pistons. Helps to keep things cool. Um, they're known to give problems in R53 when people rebuild the engine. There's a set position, even with aftermarket pistons, you have to be really careful um, that uh, you, you don't hit these. What I like to do though is you can install them after you put the crank in, but I prefer to put them in loose, uh, just finger tight at the moment. Obviously you've got to remember to uh, go by and torque them all up. You've got a bit of play so you can put the pistons in um, and then you position these around it, do a few dry runs. Uh, by hand just making sure it cranks over without touching them whatsoever and then I can lock them into place. The pistons, whilst I use an OEM one to show you, have a cutout in the skirt just there and the reason for that is to avoid these oil squirters so that's a standard piston. If you're buying aftermarket pistons they generally always come with that but that's something to be on the lookout. If it looks like this side you guarantee it's going to clash so R53 engine needs those oil squirters the W10 engine, the Cooper version, doesn't have those. It's one of the main differences between the blocks. So with those in, what I want to get in now is the shells, the main, uh, the main bearings. So this particular one goes in the middle and it's got thrust washers either side. VWs, classic VWs, um, one thing you'll notice if you ever go and have a look at one of those, if you grab the pulley um, when you're buying one uh, or your own and you can move it back and forth, you know that the thrust bearings are worn. These ones uh, don't have a habit for wearing um, but I'll get these installed then what I'm going to do is I'll go through and I like to use plastic gauge so what these are they're very thin strips of uh, plastic and what you do is you basically put a lubrication on the shell and the crank you bolt all of this together you then pull it apart and what you get uh, whether I can get to it or not quickly enough no I can't but I will show this later on, is as you can see in this picture here, there's a, a measuring gauge and you can just measure and they're not 100% accurate, but I don't have all the measuring equipment to measure the bore um, and it's a hell of a lot better than nothing. And if you go on the internet, go and have a study, these aren't too far away, providing that you use the correct lubricating grease and the correct manufacturer's torques to bolt everything together. So I'll be using those. In terms of shells, you get two sides for everything. So you get this one, which is your lower one, that's got your oil running. Uh, there's holes in this block here. And basically what we want to do is when these are installed, we want to make sure that they line up. If you get them the wrong way around, you won't have any oil feed to your crank and that'll be a problem. The other side, the cap side of your, uh, your crank, doesn't have anything in because the oil fed's there and then it's smeared around this side. So. For now what I need to do is get all of these in dry, um, I'll then get the crank in and the plan then is to get the plastic gauge set up and get that running. So what I like to do is I like to level the one side and then push the other one down. At this moment in time I'm just going to make sure by finger that they're level. This one's slightly proud at the moment uh, which means it might just need tapping down a little bit. But I'll get them in. Um, and then I can go back and uh, saw that. Obviously, if you're going to be uh, tapping these into place, you want to be using something soft because if you peen these over, that's going to be tight on your uh, on your crank, and then ultimately you're going to end up wearing that bearing away very, very quickly, uh, which is going to lead to early engine loss or catastrophic engine failure with a spun bearing. Um, these always go in really nice and easy anyway. Uh, what you don't want is a bit of your glove in there. Um, I wouldn't normally wear gloves, um, but I'm just trying to keep my hands very, very clean whilst I'm installing these. These these are always tied because of the thrust bearings, but I'll see if I can get them in by hand without, again, put my glove in. Oh, I might take these off in a minute, they're not helping at all. Right, loosely, they're in by hand. This one needs to go in a bit further. That does. So what I do is I'm just running my nail over. That one's a bit low, this is a bit high. Obviously these need to be smack on. Again, this is high, that's slightly low, that's high. Uh, I can't feel this one, uh, it's slightly low. So what I need to do now is I'll get, grab a, uh, a small piece of clean nylon 
and I'll just tap these into place. So I'll get them in, then we'll get the crank in. What I'm going to try and do now is uh, put the other shells in, again taking the uh, same approach, locating the tab, keeping it level and pushing the next bearing in. I try my best not to touch the surface uh, whilst installing these. Um, I think that seems to be one of those better practice type scenarios. Again, I'll have to just level these out, but that's okay. All of these are the same that go in the top, so it doesn't really matter what order you're going to put them in. Uh, you may get some more confusion when you get to three because you'll notice it's uh, it seems to be set up for a set of thrust washers, but there isn't any that go on this side, it's all on the lower side. Uh, the reason it is here is because this is a machined pair so everything gets line board together um, essentially this side and that side is one piece when it all gets machined and the reason for that is uh, due to tolerancing an engine build if you didn't do that this could be a couple of microns maybe a hundred microns different to that side uh, and consequently you'd end up with a step which uh, wouldn't be very good for engine life whatsoever um, so Again, what I need to do with these ones is because these are the ones I'm going to be setting up, I need to put part B lubricant onto these. It just helps the uh, plastic to flow and I also need to uh, take a small piece of uh, plastic gauge and set that up. So let's get this packet open. Um, normally these last a lifetime. I must buy a packet every time I build an engine. Um, I've got to learn to start putting these in the right place so I can find them in the future. Uh, save me buying them because they, they do last a long time. So what you get, you get your measuring tool um, which is going to be particularly useful so that goes all the way from 0.0025 all the way up to 175 micron uh, or 0.175 and then what you get is, I don't even know how many you get, maybe 10, 20 uh, plastic straws but all you need here is 10 millimeters of each one on each section of the crank that we're going to be bolting the shells to You'll notice, you may not be able to see it, um, but there's a piece of plastic gauge between each one of those. In its unmoulded form, it's essentially like a very, very thin wax crayon. When this goes on and we compress it, it will spread out and flatten. So let's see if I can get this on. There are two dowels at the front, which are what I need to locate on first. Um, once I've got those in place, it should just slide on. When we come to finish this there is a, uh, uh, yeah that's okay, okay right so that's all lined up so the next thing is what I need to do is get these bolts in. Uh, there is an order to this but first finger start them because uh, what I don't want to do is have any uh, issues with uh, stripping or cross threading that would be fairly upsetting. So uh, we'll get these in Okay, uh, I've removed the journal off the back of the engine. Uh, what you can see here and on all of the places where I had the plastic gauge, there's a slight witness mark uh, where the, uh, the plastic gauge was. That's been transferred, that's still left over on the bearing. So what I'm gonna do is just bring it closer to the camera so this can be seen. You see now, each one of those bearings has got a small squashing of the plastic. So what we do with that is obviously we've now got something we can measure. So what I do, find millimetres first and essentially just lay this over the top of the plastic that's smeared until you find a window that it fits within. So currently that's uh, 38 microns uh, and it's pretty much smack on 38 microns there. That's the same, that one's the same. If I put it to 50 microns it's definitely bigger than 50 microns. Um, and obviously it's backwards, so the more it squishes out, the less the gap is. So we've got 38 micron on that one, 38 microns on that one, and 38 microns on that one. With everything torqued up and liberally lubricated in race engine lubrication, this turns absolutely beautifully. Um, it's lovely and silent. It's, it's really, really nice. Um, you should easily be able to do this. If you've got any tight spots as you will turn in the engine over, stop. Um, it's the reason I go through uh, using the plastic gauge. It's the reason I check everything out and measure it twice. But a lot of it can be down to feel. If I could feel any tight spots as I turn this around by hand, um, I'd know straight away something was wrong with those bearings. Obviously, checking them on the plastic gauge, I already know that they're perfectly where I want them to be. 
Thank you for watching this episode of building an R53 turbocharged engine. I hope you've enjoyed it, even though I know the video footage wasn't the best and I know the audio quality at the moment still got a couple of problems until I install the new microphones. Thank you for watching. If you've got any comments, leave them below. It's always good to read them. Uh, I'll try my best to respond to everything.